yeah, so so next up we'll have uh, Johannes Inmort. And as he mentioned before, he's currently a machine learning uh, research intern at AudioShake, um, which is a really uh, cool startup focused on music source separation. Uh, and he, as he mentioned, he recently obtained his master's degree at RWTH Aachen University in Germany. And today he's going to talk about um, some work from his previous internship at Sony about removing audio effects um, from recordings. So I'll pass it over to Johannes and you can go ahead and share your screen uh, whenever you're ready. Yeah, thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, I hope you can see my screen. So yeah, um, welcome to my talk. Um, I'm super happy to discuss the practical aspects of our ISMIR 2022 paper, Distortion Audio Effects, Learning How to Recover the Clean Signal. And yeah, as Christian just said, this was my internship project at Sony Europe in 2021 uh, and was supervised by Giorgio Fabro. So one prominent example of an audio effect is guitar distortion and the clean guitar signal is usually fed to the effect device and we obtain our distorted guitar signal. In our work, we investigate whether recovering the clean guitar signal can be solved by deep neural networks designed for music source separation. So we want to, here's an audio example of a distorted guitar. And we want to turn this into the clean signal. So for this presentation, I want to keep it a little bit more general and concentrate on the general task of audio effect removal while showing you some examples from the paper on distortion removal. So there has been extensive previous research on neural audio effect modeling using a black box approach. And in using this approach, the input audio signal is usually, usually fed to a neural network, could be anything here. And then we obtain the processed signal. And there's some loss function, which calculates the difference between the target and the input. And a very common procedure to do this is supervised training on aligned data. So you have dry data on the one side and affected or wet data on the other side. You train this. Um, in our work, we basically formula formulated the inverse task. Namely, we wanted to restore the original signal by training a neural network the other way around. So uh, yeah, we the input of the system is the affected data and the output is the dry, unaffected data. And basically we can consider three important practical aspects when training an effect removal system in a supervised manner. So the first one is data. So where do we get it? The second one, uh, after we obtained our dry data set, which contains unaffected stems, basically, we want to process it with an um, audio effect that we can choose. And finally, we need to select an architecture and also the training algorithm then. And I will go into some details how to choose it. So let's start with the data. So generally, uh, I think there are two options. So we could train only on one source in order to limit the signal statistics that need to be reconstructed by the neural network. But we could also gather a generic audio data set consisting of different kinds of instrumental sources and also mixtures, also maybe some test signals. But in our study, we achieve definitely better results when training a model for one particular, particular source. Oh. So... Um, um, I think there are also three then three options to collect the dry data. And the first one is to collect the source data from public data sets. And there are several options. For example, to give some examples, MuseDB18 contains this originally was originally proposed for music source separation and contains stems for drums, bass, vocals, and other instruments. Then there's MedleyDB. There are also the unaffected um, stems or sources available, but you need to pick them manually. And then there's signal train, which contains like var various mixtures and test signal sounds, and also Slack, which is a synthetic data set. Then uh, it's also possibly possible to manually gather the dry source data from different sources, such as YouTube, SoundCloud. You could um, 
pick recordings of solo performance that are released as an um, album. And also you can gather the data from loop packages. This is what we did for the distortion removal paper, actually, because we really needed dry source data. And finally, if you're a musician, you could, of course, record the data yourself to generate it automatically using, um, or alternatively, you could also generate it automatically using virtual instruments, um, for example, VST plugins and the MIDI database. And for the paper, we used 1.7 hours of dry guitar data, which is not that much, but it worked because we used quite small models. So yeah, actually it should be possible to record it yourself. So now that we have the dry source data, we need to process it somehow. So um, also here we have two options. First one is if you have some nice analog gear, you of course could record different um, parameter um, presets from your analog gear and pass it through and then record it again. That's of course laborious. So maybe it's easier to use the second option here, which is easier to use, the, for example, the SOX package which has a, has a nice Python wrapper as well to process your audio. Um, there's also Pedalboard, which was released unfortunately after we um, published our paper. And um, there you can use um, VST plugins to process your audio automatically using various parameters. And there's also an uh, implementation called LILF where you can load LLV2 um, plugins as an alternative to pedal pedalboard. And yeah, you should sample the parameters randomly. That's also what we did in the paper. And generally I can recommend for augmentations um, before applying the processing, um, pitch shifting, time stretching, and resampling to um, uh, synthetically enlarge your data set if it's not that big already. So as an example from the paper, I want to briefly introduce you to the types of distortion models we used. And here on the left side, we see the waveform of a guitar signal. And on the right side, we see the respective frequency components. And firstly, we used Hard clipping as a simplified distortion model. The amplitude is just cut off at a defined threshold here. And another example of static wave shaping is soft clipping, where the signal saturates slowly before reaching the fully saturated state. And finally, of course, we are interested in the distortions of real analog devices based on electronic circuits. So um, yeah, we generally observe the introduction of harmonics and intermodulation distortion in the frequency domain. And ideally, these should be filtered out by our approach. So next step is how to choose the architecture. In the paper, we concentrated on modeling the inverse process of audio effect, modeling using, for example, the CRAFX architecture as one example. Um, Actually, it turned out that the, the music source separation models that we investigated as well uh, performed much better in the study. So here we formulated the problem as a filtering problem. And um, yeah, this yielded uh, actually better results. And we compared different architectures. You definitely should check out the sound demixing challenge for the latest trends in music source separation. I mean, many of these architectures can be seen as generic audio to audio transformation architectures and work also well on different tasks. So make sure to check out the latest trends here. Then of course, that's not part of our study. Uh, it would be very interesting to investigate diffusion models for effect removal as an outlook. And um, there has been some research on diffusion models for inverse audio problems with some promising results. But of course, here's also the challenge to make it work in real time on small chunks. So that's part of future work. Another challenge um, with uh, the plugin challenge in mind, of course, is that we need to have causal models. It's a hard requirement for the real-time operation. And many of those architectures are originally not meant for real-time um, operation. So you need to adapt those architectures. And uh, yeah, you, you uh, 
basically you need to transform all bidirectional recurrent neural uh, networks to unidirectional recurrent neural networks and also non-causal convolutions to causal convolutions so that um, like the most recent sample is only calculated based on previous samples and not on future samples. Um, then of course you need to make this working uh, in a blockwise processing manner. And I think it's advisable to experiment with different frame sizes and hop sizes to get like a good um, um, combination of those that uh, has not uh, um, lower uh, requirements with respect to the computational complexity, um, but also good output, output quality. There are some implementation examples of these kind of networks. Um, for example, um, DMUX is available as a real-time implementation with fewer parameters for speech enhancement. So make sure to check out how Alexandre Defossé implemented this. And also Christian Steinmetz published um, his micro TCN, which uh, is also based on causal convolutions and has a real-time implementation available. So make sure to check this out. So now that we got an overview on how to train audio effect removal systems, let's very briefly get into, into some results from the paper. So here we investigated the models for removing the SOX overdrive algorithm on guitar data. And while we investigated multiple evaluation metrics, one takeaway is that we got excellent results for DMUX and WaveUnit which outputs are virtually indistinguishable from the target. Um, let's listen to one example from the test set. First, you hear the distorted input, then DMUX, the prediction, and then the target. Yeah, I have to say that the SOX overdrive algorithm mixes the wet with the dry signal actually. And we found that this property was a significant reason that enabled this good performance. While mixing dry and wet signals is not too familiar for distortion actually, for other effects such as compression or reverberation, this is relatively common or natural. So the models on the, under evaluation could yield good performance on those effects too. Um, just try it out and if you scan this, QR code, um, there are more audio examples available. So now you might ask yourself, why would someone want to remove audio effects at all? Maybe it's a bit strange, but here I came up with some ideas for developing a plug-in based on the research we did. Um, so firstly, on the one hand side, it's definitely very interesting to build a plug-in for music enhancement. So you could simulate bad recordings, for example, using various VST plugins and create some presets um, in order to turn um, yeah, good recordings into bad and then train a system on the other way around, basically. Um, and also combined with the music source separation, this approach could be very useful for re remixing live recordings, for example, where only the mixture is available. And on the end side, one could explore effect removal as a creative tool. And I could imagine that it could be used to reprocess affected samples or to even intentionally degrade audio similar to a bit crushing plugin, for example. So if you want to add some DMUX style artifacts. Moreover, you could train a system that removes any particular audio effect and then apply it to unprocessed, unprocessed input audio. And I'm very curious what would happen if you train such a system on, for example, heavy distortion only, and then apply it to undistorted signals. So yeah, I think there are many more applications for this kind of audio to audio transformation networks. So just get creative. And regarding research, one very interesting aspect lies in developing an effect transfer system, I think. so. One idea we had is to disentangle the effect and timber from the input audio. So for example, um, by the use of metric learning and an autoencoder with an interpretable latent space, um, um, such a system could be realized. And here, that's just a very 
quick sketch. I outlined how such a system could look like, but we did only some very early experiments on this so far. Um, and I think it would lead a little bit uh, too far to go into details here, but I hope you get the idea and maybe you can explore it on, on your own. So um, to conclude, we showed that recovering the clean signal from distorted audio can be efficiently solved with neural networks designed for source separation. And I would be super happy to see more results on other effects from other people and their real-time implementation as a plugin. Um, the main challenges here are collecting dry training data, as I said earlier, um, and also adapting the architectures to the real-time processing. Finally, uh, as I said, it's very interesting to build this effect transfer system, but there is, of course, more research necessary. So yeah, thanks a lot. And I'm very happy to discuss further results. Uh, just re reach out to me. Thanks a lot. And if you scan this QR code, there are more results. And um, yeah, I'm happy if you read the paper. Thanks a lot. Awesome. Thanks so much, Johannes. That was really awesome. I really appreciated the kind of additional insights that you gave some new ideas throwing out there. I always love to see that. Um, yeah, yeah anyone you. that has anyone that has questions in the chat, please uh, put them put them there, and we'll get to them. Um, but I'll also start it off with a question. Um, I was wondering if you looked at all into how important kind of having that dry data is that you were talking about, because right, some of those data sets that you mentioned, maybe they don't have perfectly clean sources. Like maybe for like guitar, you can get clean, but then when it comes to vocals and things like that, maybe it's harder to find clean sources with kind of no effects on them. So I'm curious if you have any insights into what happens if there's already some effects present kind of on the source recordings that you um, use. Could you still actually build a system with that? Yeah, sure. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, yeah, very interesting. So uh, I mean, the problem is if you want to train a de-reverberation de system and there's already reverb on the signal, I think that's very bad. You cannot do this. But um, what we did um, or what we experimented with, we had like clean guitar, but it was not dry in, in, a, in a sense that there was reverb on the guitar. And we used this act actually for training and it worked uh, quite well also. So I think it's it's very important to make sure that the effect that you want to remove is not present in the dry signal. Um, if you want to remove multiple effects, of course, then you really need dry stems. Uh, yeah, and it's, it's hard to get this data actually. Yeah, makes sense. Any other questions from those in the Zoom or anyone online? I don't, we don't have any in the chat yet, but yeah, if there's anyone online here in Zoom that has a question, you also feel free to, to ask. Cool. Well, if not, that's that's great. Uh, yeah, yeah, thanks a lot. Appreciate, appreciate so much your time and preparing this talk and then sharing uh, your work with us. Super interesting. Um, yeah, and if, also, if you go ahead and share a link with us, maybe to the paper or the repo that you want, we can also share with those in the chat on, on YouTube so, uh, so people can check out your work. Yeah, thanks for having me. Thanks. Definitely.